Hello and welcome to Get Yourself Optimized. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, and today it's my distinct pleasure to have Dr. Ben Goetzel with us. Ben is a cross-disciplinary scientist, entrepreneur, and author. He leads the Singularity Net Foundation, the Open Cog Foundation, and the AGI Society, which runs the annual Artificial General Intelligence Conference. Ben also chairs the futurist nonprofit Humanity Plus and serves as chief scientist of AI firm Singularity Studio, Rejuve, Singularity DAO, and Accelerando Media, all parts of the, of the Singularity Net ecosystem. As chief scientist of robotics firm Hanson Robotics, he led the software team behind the Sophia Robot. As chief AI scientist of Awakening Health, he leads the team crafting the mind behind Sophia's little sister, Grace. Ben's research work encompasses multiple areas, including AGI, artificial general intelligence, natural language processing, cognitive science, machine learning, computational finance, bioinformatics, virtual worlds, gaming, parapsychology, theoretical physics, and more. He's published 25 scientific books, 150 technical papers, and numerous journalistic articles. Ben, it's so great to have you on the show. Well, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. So let, let's start by, uh, for our listeners, uh, understanding around uh, artificial general intelligence and how that's different from just traditional AI or artificial intelligence. Can you differentiate that? Maybe uh, throw in M ML machine learning in there as well so we can kind of get everybody on the same page. Yeah, I, I, I look at the history of AI as really involving three stages. There's narrow AI, then AGI, artificial general intelligence, and then finally, ASI, artificial super intelligence, which is, is intelligence far beyond the, beyond the human level. And these distinctions were not clear in the middle of the last century when the AI field was first founded. It was an interesting discovery that you could make AI programs doing things like play chess or, or checkers or do differential calculus or something that, that, or figure out what ad to place in a web page. It was a major discovery that AI could be made to do these things in a way. These are called like expert systems, right? Some some of them are right. So mm -hmm. the definition of a narrow AI is an AI that's smart at doing one particular type of thing, but isn't smart at doing the broad scope of things that humans are, and can't transfer its knowledge from that one little domain it's good at. In order, in order to other other domains, and it wasn't really clear at the outset of the AI field that you could do so many impressive, exciting things with very narrowly defined AI systems. And there's various ways to build narrow AI systems. So, what's classically called an expert system was a system that was supplied with a bunch of human coded rules telling it exactly what to do. Like you know if if your blood pressure is above this level or, or, or below this level and your age is above this level, you might have hypertension or something. But you can also build a narrow AI system using what's called supervised learning, which is an important part of what's now commonly called machine learning, right? Where instead of coding in a bunch of rules, you create a data set, right? So if you're trying to make an expert system to estimate, say, credit default risk, you make a big data set of people who borrowed money you have information on who paid it back, who didn't, then the machine learning system learns the rules that will tell you which people are likely to pay back their debt or not. You don't have to type in the exact rules like, well, you know, if you're this age, you live in this part of the country, you have this many kids, you're likely not to pay back your debt. The machine learning system learns those rules, but it's still doing something highly specific and focused based on a data set that, that a human curated, cleaned up, and, and provided to it. And I mean, narrow AIs can be super valuable, as we see all throughout the global e economy now, and they can hit every vertical market from, you know, face recognition to financial trading to writing, you know, simple news reports about weather or, 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 sp or sports or something or diagnosing a disease based on symptoms. On the other hand, an, an AGI system needs to be able to do things that its programmers never thought of, right? And do things that it was not prepared for and pivot to fundamentally new domains and new types of problems. And we don't, we don't yet have 
AI systems that are, that are good at, at doing that. And I think that's, that's really the next wave of the AI revolution is going beyond narrow AI that where each AI serves one particular thing to AGI where an AI can deal with the unforeseen and unexpected in a creative, imaginative and improvisatory way. I would say which problems need AGI and which don't is something we're discovering as we as we go along. So say whether full self-driving requires AGI is not yet obvious. I suspect it does not. But some people think it does, and you don't you don't know until you're until you're there, right? So that and say, let's say being an AI mathematician, being able to solve to prove more math theorems than any human mathematician, including new ones that are unknown. Does that just need a narrow like math AI, or does it need something that can really think imaginatively and and and, and broadly? And the AI field has been pretty bad so far including myself, at guessing in advance which problems are going to be solvable by sort of narrow AI, rule-driven or data-driven hacks rather than needing the kind of intelligence that people have. But then the term AGI also shouldn't be overinterpreted because humans are not maximally general purpose either. I mean, in fact, you know, humans are very stupid about many things a lot of the time, as we see in, in human society, human society generally, and as we each see in our own lives, as we look back at choices we previously made, right? So yeah. we're not maximally generally intelligent systems. And it's pretty clear that, you know, the, the constraints of the physical universe, which themselves may not be absolute, right? But the, the constraints of the physical universe should allow for intelligence is going far beyond human level and that's where you get into asi or artificial super intelligence and one way of looking at that is once we get to an ai that's you know as smart as you or me but has the ability to revise its own source code and rebuild its own hardware it may not be that long before that agi improves itself you know recursively and iteratively and, and becomes twice as smart as people. But then once it's twice as smart as people, it has all that intelligence to use to become four times as smart as people and, 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 and so forth, right? So this gets into the notion of a technological singularity put forth by my friend Ray Kurzweil and many others and the, the idea that human level AGI is a sort of threshold. Like, well, we'll work to make narrow AIs more and more general at some point, we'll get something that has the same level of generality of intelligence as a human. And in a way, humans are sort of the minimal generally intelligent system. We're about as stupid as you can be and still be able to under understand yourself and improve yourself and, and, and build new versions of yourself. Once you get to that threshold level of human level AGI, that may see recursively self-improving AGI, spawning superintelligence and, and, and singularity and all that. And where we are now, we're sort of at the borderline between the narrow AI revolution and the next wave of, of the AGI revolution, which is a very interesting, interesting place to be. Yeah, it is. And uh, with the law of accelerating returns and you know, Moore's law and Metcalf's law and so forth, uh, things are just growing at an exponential rate in terms of uh, the technological advances. It's exciting, but it, for some at least, are, it's pretty terrifying too, because if we have super intelligent uh, AIs and we don't uh, look very uh, virtuous to them, <laughs> kind of a scourge on the planet, yeah. will we get... I mean, uh, I... I, I... You know, I find what's going on in Ukraine more terrifying. And in Ethiopia, I find that the fact that half of Ethiopian children grow up with brain stunting because of malnutrition. I mean, this these these things are more terrifying. So there, there's the risk. You can build a super AI that doesn't see the value in, in humans. There's also the risk that humans don't evolve in terms of ethics and judgment at the same rate as we're evolving in terms of technology and without without AGI to help us run the show i mean then then 
what sort of mess are humans going to make, right? So we've yeah. we've got interesting risks all around. And then getting getting to the subject of your podcast, I mean, we we also have, I think, significant advances in human self awareness and, and and human individual and collective consciousness and and, and ethics. So we we are. We are we are advancing as humans in profound ways, even though it's not always displayed in politics and 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 warfare and and the distribution of of technology throughout the world. So it's it's quite quite interesting the balance of uh of good things and not so good things in 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 the human world now as we set about launching a singularity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now there's uh there's the potential for kind of worldwide uh destruction kind of skynet and so forth with AI but there's also a real risk of a global catastrophe with molecular nanotechnology and the gray goo problem where these self replicating nanobots could just continue nonstop until all resources have been t- depleted to zero uh any thoughts on that well, that's a risk. I, I would say we also have a risk of global thermonuclear war, which looks a lot more palpable at the moment, right? So, I mean, I think in a way people like to think about these far off risks that are hard to assess as a mode of distraction from the the large, obvious risks that are here right now. So, yeah, nanotech is there, but looking closer to home, I mean, You've got the potential of a U.S.-Russia nuclear war and maybe China helping Russia. We've, we've got the COVID virus, which appears not to have been human engineered. But on the other hand, when you look closer and closer at gain of function research, you have to ask, like, could, what what viruses could humans actually engineer if somebody wanted to, right? So, I mean, there is the risk of superintelligence. There's a risk of nanotech running, running, running amok. But, I mean... There's also risks of global thermonuclear war, and there's risks of bioengineered viruses taking the next level beyond COVID, which is relatively mild as as, as viruses go. So there's there's a broad spectrum of, of of risks, and I would say I I have less fear of technology per se than of the human beings in 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 and human organizations really in, in power over marshalling humanity's resources because hmm. AGI, super intelligence, molecular nanotechnology, biotechnology, it's quite plain all of these things could be used in a way that's utopic or in a way that's dystopic, right? I mean, these are all very flexible technologies. There's no evidence that any one of these technologies is like inevitably leading down some path of horrible doom, doom and, and, and destruction. Yeah. So what, you know, how these technologies are, are rolled out is going to depend in large part on which human institutions are, are guiding their, their rollout. And there you, you come down to the fact that the main uses of AI on the planet now are selling, killing, spying, and, and corrupt gambling in, in various forms. And I, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a worry, right? If that's what's on the mind of the, the super AI as it, as it ev- evolves. And so then, I mean, I'm trying to counteract that by helping to foster development of narrow AI and AGI in a democratic decentralized fashion and trying to do beneficial AGI projects for medicine, for scientific research, for education and so forth. But at the moment, decentralized, democratic, beneficial, no AI or AGI is kind of a drop in the bucket compared to the the growing, you know, corporate slash government slash espionage slash military uh, AI ecosystem, right? And so that's that's a challenge you can try to confront head on or you can try to confront in a in a subtler way by planting seeds of of decentralized beneficial AGI and planting seeds of positive human consciousness and and then trying to foster exponential exponential growth in these things yeah 
Well, it's great what you're up to. I really like it. And uh, yeah, what you uh, pointed out about the dystopian uses of AI, what one comes to mind, uh, the world leader in facial recognition AI, by a long shot, my understanding, is China. And that's pretty scary. I think every... China may be slightly ahead in face recognition now, but everybody's there. I mean, that that's a commodity. And it's interesting that in, in 2014, computer vision and face recognition were still a research thing, right? And then by, by 2017 or so, it's pretty much a commodity that's everywhere. And I mean, one company may be at 99.8% accuracy, the other is at 99.6% accuracy. But Pretty much face recognition in in good lighting, you know, when someone hasn't aged 10 years or grown a beard or something, it's, it's a solved problem. Even face recognition with masks is largely a solved, pro- solved problem now, right? So, I mean, what's interesting there to me is how quickly that went from being a research subject to being a widely deployed commodity. We've seen natural language processing go through the same arc between 2018 when Google launched the BERT model and then 2021-22. So we may see the same, say, two to four year arc of development in AGI, where AGI goes from being a research topic to being a commodity rolled out everywhere. And it may take two, three, four years to make that transition, just because that's how long people take to learn each other's code and read each other's papers and and deploy computer net, computer networks. And, and, and fine-tune things, right? So I, I think uh, China, U.S., Russia, and the rest of the world in terms of AI. So I probably have as good a view on this as, as anyone. I mean, I, I lived in Hong Kong for, for nine years and relocated back to the U.S. two years ago. I spent a bunch of time in, in Shenzhen, Beijing, Shanghai, various centers in mainland China. And my project Singularity in it now, which is a globally distributed AI meets blockchain platform, Singularity Net, we have offices everywhere everywhere on the planet. We have a team in Hong Kong working on humanoid robots, and we, our largest AI development office is in St. Petersburg, is in Russia. We had some team members in Kiev who we've recently helped get a bus to get out, and they're, they're now same with some of our other team members in, in, in Poland. So I think I've seen what goes on around the planet. Certainly, there's no monopoly on AI expertise. Like there, there's brilliant AGI and neuro AI developers, young and old, all over the place. I mean, we've we've got a substantial AI development office in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. We've been looking at doing an AGI R and D lab in, in, in Nairobi, in, in in Kenya. I mean, there's there's no shortage of, of people with deep knowledge of AGI, R&D, computer science, cognitive science, whatever. Like there's no monopoly in Silicon Valley in Beijing or, or, or whatever. I mean, I, I think China has been unparalleled in recent years in taking advanced AI and rolling it out commercially at, at, at large scale. And they've done better at that than the US or Western Europe. If you look at the recent revolutions in computer vision and natural language processing, these were all led by innovations from the U.S. and Western Europe. I mean, quantum computing, you'd say the same thing. It's led by innovations from U.S. and Western Europe. This is not a racist thing. I mean, this is largely Chinese and Indian scientists operating in U.S. and Western Europe along, al- alongside white people and, and, and black people working in U.S., and Western Europe universities and tech companies. It's it's just that the business ecosystem, mainly in the US, also UK, you know, Germany, France, the ecosystem in US and Western Europe has been better than anywhere else at technology transfer, at taking stuff out of university labs and out of small startups and deploying it at, at large scale and f- figure figuring out figuring out how to make research innovations practical, right? And once something has then been proven practical, China has then been super fast at taking it out and scaling it up even more to like to their billion and a half people. 
China has not yet proved effective at tech t- transfer, at taking stuff that's at the university or like individual gonzo hacker level and and transferring it to being commercially viable. Russia has not yet been, been good at doing that either. So I, I'd say U.S. and Western Europe still are the only places that's been good at taking stuff out of the research lab and turning it into something that's practical and, and commercially viable. I don't see that changing anytime soon. It seems that the Chinese investment community has very little appetite for technology risk, although a large appetite for market risk. And they, they want to see something that's already been proven and practiced somewhere else in the world before they, before they put investment into rolling it out in China. Russia, even before the current Russian economic setback, which looks to be severe, was pretty much the, the same way. I mean, you have insanely innovative and insanely insane like R- R- Russian mad scientists coming up with all sorts of, of wild new stuff. Very hard for them to get business investment within Russia until it's been proven in, in U.S., w- w- Western Europe, or s- somewhere else out, outside Russia, right? So it's a quite quite interesting ecosystem in that inventing new ideas is happening everywhere. It's happening in universities everywhere. It's happening with crazy hackers everywhere. Then transfer from the crazy idea phase to the commercial product phase happens US, UK, Germany. Then China, Russia, everywhere takes that, redeploys it, rolls it out for their for their own purposes. And this happens quite rapidly within months to years, the transition between between these different phases. So it's quite a complex global ecosystem, really. And, you know, the core algorithms underlying AI are published. They're in papers on arcsav.org. They're in code that's on GitHub. And Chinese researchers and Russian ones are posting the papers in arcsav and putting the code in GitHub also. But where AI really happens is when that code meets data and meets large amounts of processors, right? And that 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 takes money. And that, that means so far Chinese government or US big tech companies, right? And that's that's where I think we need to work on decentralizing things. Like discovery and innovation are already decentralized. Deployment and commercial rollout are heavily centralized in a few big tech companies or a few governments. And that's where I've been thinking blockchain has a role to play. Just like Bitcoin is decentralized money and you know, Singularity Net aims to be decentralized AI processing power. And the thinking here is that the vast teeming mass of disorganized humanity is going to be better than a, a, a centralized government or a big tech company in shepherding us toward the, toward the singularity. The risks there are obvious because the vast teeming mass of, of humanity is a it, 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 it is it is a mess, right? And yeah, actually, this was a question I had had for you after looking at a bit of your podcast. Like, how do you how do you see the progress of of human consciousness? Like, I, I mean, how do you? We have a technological singularity coming about, right? Like, technology is advancing exponentially. Do you think there's a hope that human self awareness and human ethics and human, you know? positive compassion development progresses exponentially to match? Or are we looking at the future where technology gets more and more powerful and exponentially advances, but human advancement is, is, is linear? Hmm. You know, I, I would have answered this very differently just a couple of years ago, uh, prior to my uh, spiritual awakening on January 22nd of last year. The way I'd answer it now is I have the all uh, like um, immense faith and certainty around the uh, evolution of humanity collectively to awaken and uh, not destroy the planet and to utilize AGI and molecular nanotechnology and all that as it comes in a way that is benevolent. Um, but that's not going to be the reality for everybody. Some people are mired in darkness and, and negativity. 
And, you know, like uh, Ram Das would say, we're all just walking each other home. Those people are going to take a longer time and take some detours to get home. And their version... And they may be the ones with their finger on the nuclear button. Yes, but that'll be for their reality, their slice of the multiverse, not ours. Right? There are infinite numbers of uh, parallel universes happening, and each of us are in the driver's seat of ours as the observer. So if you believe in uh, benevolence and a, uh, you know unconditionally loving uh, creator and all the kind of magic of, uh, you know, I, I, I know one of your areas of focus um, in, in study was parapsychology, and that would include things like telepathy. Like that stuff is real. And how could it be real if, um, it, you know, if it's all we saw was what meets the eye, right? It's not seeing and then believing, it's actually believing and then seeing. Uh, that's that's how you manifest uh, reality in this simulation that that we call our Earth, our reality. So I'm curious to hear what your take is on all of that, because uh, that's that's kind of a mouthful. But uh, yeah, why don't you why don't you take it from here? Yeah. So parapsychology is its own topic. I, I I do believe the data for that is is pretty strong that that precognition ESP and other such phenomena exist even though you know there's a lot of fraud in in in, in that domain like it like in like in in many others it's interesting i i've in, been fairly involved with the parapsychology research community in the past few years and there there's a couple different camps there and one is yeah this is real it's a physics phenomenon. It's just physics we don't know yet. But there's nothing sort of spiritual or spooky there, right? It's just, you know, the human brain through some quantum mechanical variation that we we haven't figured out yet. The human brain can, can send signals. And quantum mechanics already tells us that the flow of time is not as, as one, one directional as classical physics assumed. So there, there's that one school of thought that these things are real and we just need to learn that, that bit of physics, right? And just, just as we didn't used to have the physics of outer space, we'll have, we'll have the physics of ESP precognition and, and whatnot. There's another school of thought that psi phenomena, to understand them, you need to shift to a whole different point of view than modern scientific materialism and take a point of view that consciousness is, is the ground and our physical universe is one among many manifestations within a, a you know, a deeper field of, of consciousness. And then Psi has to do with this deeper field of consciousness sort of intervening in the apparent physical world in, in, in ways that, that physics doesn't encompass. And I'm, I find myself sort of torn between these two directions, thinking there's elements of truth in both. Like, I think there there is going to be new physics that we don't know yet. I mean, the field of physics has revolutionized itself over and over in the past few centuries. There's going to be new physics that we just haven't discovered yet that's going to help us quantify a lot of these phenomena that now seem, you know, spooky and incomprehensible. On the other hand, I also do tend toward a sort of Buddhistic view that consciousness, you know, panpsychic consciousness is, is, is the ground and in a way, the physical world we live in is an illusion built up by individual and, and collective minds. Or illusion isn't the ideal world. It's, it's, a, it's a construct. It's a collective construct. And each of ourselves is, 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 a, is a construct. And to some level, aspects of ESP, precognition, and so on, are going to be best understood by taking this consciousness first, consciousness first point of view. Some aspects may be best understood by you know, next generation physics point of view, and we haven't unraveled all the threads yet. But I would say these two perspectives of the empirical and the more consciousness oriented, these certainly both exist when thinking about the singularity and the future of, of AGI also. Because I would say if if I put my pure sort of Bayesian rationalist hat on and look at the future of AGI and the singularity, the main conclusion I come to is like, we just don't know. Like, I, I mean, the, 
if you're going to create something twice as smart as a human or 10 times as smart as a human, it's idiotic to think you can rationally predict what that what that thing is going to do. We can't even predict what the weather is going to be next week. We can't predict what the stock market is 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 going to do. We can't predict what random thought is going to come into the the next demagogic leader's head and is going to direct geopolitics, right? So the idea that we could really know with any certainty or predict with any certainty whether a super AGI is going to bring love and benefit to humans and other sentient beings, or is going to decide that we're a sort of inefficient use of mass energy. Like we, we just can't know that any prediction we make has a very, very wide confidence interval, right? And a very small degree of certainty. And that doesn't mean we can't or shouldn't act, act in a way that we estimate has the greatest possible benefit because what, what, what else can we do? Right. But, but the, our own ignorance is profound. On the other hand, if I take a more sort of spiritual, personal, intuitive perspective and ask, like, what what do I feel in my heart and soul? I, I feel very positive, right? And, I mean, I, I if I set aside the rational, logical, calculating mind and just rest in... A meditative state and 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 a state of that 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 sort of non rational insight. I feel like the positive post singularity world is already there. Like I, I feel like I can I can mentally or even trans mentally in a way establish a, a contact a contact with it, and I can I can feel that there are beneficial post singularity minds there. Some were created by humans, some are uploaded humans and enhanced humans, some are non-human minds that we have established contact with post-singularity that we're just not able to contact now because of the limitations of our, of our conventional states of consciousness. And one can feel those post-singularity minds there. And there's even a retrocausal aspect where one can feel post-singularity minds in a way reaching reaching back and helping to foster their own creation. And I mean... Terence McKenna had these ideas. Terence McKenna also thought 2012 was going to be the end of the old order and the launch of the new world, which I, 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 I was never a big believer in, right? So I, I find myself in a state of interesting tension between my rational calculating side, which is like, we have no idea what the hell is going to happen, but we can try to militate things as best we can in a positive direction. Like let's, let's go with democracy. It seems better than, than anything else, right? Let's go with, with decentralization. It's certainly better than self-serving elite groups, right? Let, let's go with making AIs that do medicine and, and do science and that do education, which are good things and get beneficial stuff in the minds of the democratic decentralized AGIs we build because, Hey, that's going to bias things in a positive direction more likely than not. And what else do we have to go on? I'm torn between that and then a sort of spiritual sense of irrational certainty or transrational certainty that like this is going in a positive direction. Like this is, this is going to be awesome if we just, flow with things in an open-minded, open, open-hearted yeah, let go way. And let God. And that I, I don't, I don't think you have to reconcile the, the, these two things. I mean, one of the realizations I've come to in my technical AI work is human minds are not consistent, and that's okay. I mean, there there's something called paraconsistent logic within the field of mathematical logic, which is these are logic systems that can hold contradictory things in mind and just work with that contradiction without becoming trivial and without going crazy, but they can... They can leverage that contradiction to generate new interesting mm-hmm. things. They can be contradictory in some regards without being contradictory in, in, in all in all regards, right? And human minds are paraconsistent. The OpenCog Hyperon system, which is the main AGI project I'm building on the Singularity Net platform, is is capable of reasoning in paraconsistent logic. And I'm I'm okay with being a paraconsistent reasoning system myself and dealing with a you know a part of my mind that's very hard-nosed and rational and and a, a part of my mind that's very 
in, intuitive and, and going with, with, with the flow. And we, we just need to see these contradictions in ourselves clearly for, for what they are and, and, and work with them because trying to achieve, you know, there's a quote from Emerson, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of simple minds, right? Like trying, trying to force consistency when it's not, when it's not fundamental, fundamentally the way things work, that just results in minds that shut off parts of themselves from other parts of themselves, which, which, which ultimately doesn't, doesn't, foster maximum goodness maximum joy growth and 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 choice mm. you know what uh, comes to mind when well, well that, that, that that was a long <laughs> rant that, that that was a longer rant than i intended oh, to great. give but that that's great. so, goes, so yeah. one concept that i think is related to what you're describing about kind of not necessarily re resolving the contradictions but just being okay with them existing is uh, a, a concept that i kind of live by which is the willing suspension of disbelief because that opens you up to so many possibilities, to infinite potentialities, right? And if you're closed-minded and, uh, and narrow in your thinking and you're, what, what you're open to or willing to consider, then you've you're closed yourself off to so much um, like existential bliss, really. Like you mentioned Ter Terrence McKenna. And I, I had a, uh, a, a psychedelic experience that didn't involve any drugs and it didn't even involve uh any kind of uh hyperventilating type breathing it was just getting touched on the head by a oneness monk a very um uh, elevated consciousness uh monk and this was in india in 2012 uh he gave he gave me what what's called a diksha oneness blessing and uh everything was in technicolor like a cartoon it was incredible i felt this deep connection to god to all that is to like the fabric of creation and up until that point in my life at age 42 i was agnostic i didn't believe in anything i was a skeptic i was a scientist i was like almost a cynic i mean i was not really that cynical but i wasn't very open uh, to it so that was a huge uh, shift in my life. And then all these miracles started happening. And, and, you know, so it's, it can be hard to, if you're very scientific to, to, to kind of resolve that, uh, idea of, or that experience of, of miracles and synchronicities and, um, just stuff that doesn't seem to naturally happen or shouldn't you know, kind of a like glitch in the matrix sort of thing. And it happens over and over and over again. That's pretty amazing. And um, so I'm, I'm curious to hear from you what sort of um, experience or moment happened for you in, in, in regards to uh, paranormal or supernatural stuff that got you interested in parapsychology? Did you have some sort of... Um, I don't know, some, some, uh, spiritual epiphany, some sort of psychic, uh, event happen. Do you see a ghost? Like what happened? So in, ter in terms of spirituality, I would say I've, I went back and forth many times over, over the course of my life. I, I think in the early childhood, my mom was going to graduate school in Chinese history. So she had all these books on history of Buddhism and Taoism, Chinese thinking around. So I dug into these when I was maybe seven or eight years old. And it was, it was, it was quite interesting. I mean, that's where I encountered sort of the notion of, of meditation and the, like the bardos between one life, one life and the other and, and, and so forth. And it, at that age, your mind is a little more open. And I, I could feel myself somehow sinking into, into a, a state where, where, there is a broader space in which our, our own world is, a, is a, a tiny little speck. Then I, I got into Uspensky when I was in, in middle school and it, Uspensky in search of the miraculous. He's a R Russian mystic, but he, he, he wrote that most people are basically walking zombies in a sleep almost all the time. And he, he wanted you to try to be acutely conscious every, every, every waking moment of everything. So, 
I spent I spent most of middle school trying to do that, like trying to be awake all the time, including while sleeping, right? Which is is a, it, interesting. I'm sure I was doing it in a somewhat misguided way, but it led me to some quite interesting states of consciousness. It was it was particularly funny. I, I was a very misbehaving middle school student, so you would get put in, in detention after school. You weren't allowed to read or do homework. You just had to sit there in a the chair. So I, I would drive them crazy by just sitting there and like meditating and blissing out during detention instead of being pissed off about being being stuck in the chair for, for 45 minutes after, after school. But So I, I sort of went back and forth between that and being very hard-nosed and scientific about things. I mean, I... I discovered psychedelics, I guess, when I was 15 or something. I started university at 15, and co- college college is a place for these things. And it, that that certainly added a new twist to it, because when, you, when you're in a psychedelic experience together with others, you have the complete faith that you can see certain things in their minds and, 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 and vice versa, right? Like a, telepathy and precognition seem almost obvious in that state of mind, but then then you the drug wears off and you're like well was was any of that real or was that entirely a delusion and then you have, the same thing with say a psychedelic like dmt or ayahuasca you could take that and you're like well I, either i just spent an infinite amount of time conversing with this benevolent army of mischievous infinite dimensional intelligences who transmitted to me information far beyond anything the human mind can understand either that or like some neuron in my brain was stimulated in some weird way, giving me that illusion, which means absolutely nothing, right? And, yeah. it, it, it was, it was. The which was it? I, I, I have no, I have no idea, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, I, I would say, it took me a long time to integrate these two ways of thinking in my mind because a lot of, I mean, I, I definitely grew up as a, as an atheistic communist and I mean I I had completely rational oriented in a, in, in a way in spite of these spiritual expeditions and I did not like religious woo-woo stuff at, at all and like the fortune teller at the beach trying to read your future in a crystal ball looked at insanely full of shit <laughs> like the newspaper horoscope looks amazingly full uh, i of can shit, totally right? so relate i, I was I, raised I, by a jehovah's witness and a catholic a and pretty, uh, i thought it was all bunk all bunk. yeah, yeah. I, I was pretty pretty and a lot of that is right i still think a lot of it is so i was very strongly very strongly anti-bullshit and pro data right and actually i had had various ESP type experiences and I'd been close to people who had really strong remote viewing experiences, like seeing seeing things occurring in a remote location which you could have no data for and then you you go there and and, and whoa that that yeah. thing obviously yeah, actually real. happened. <laughs> still still having having these sorts of experiences of reading what's in someone else's mind and finding afterwards it was true. Having these sorts of experiences didn't quite convince me. I, I was sort of like, well, either this shit is real or I'm going crazy and either one is entirely possible. And then I I got to know the science fiction writer, Damien Broderick, and he wrote the book Outside the Gates of Science, which is a sort of popular expedition on psi phenomena. And... I followed up all the references in that book and spent like six months of spare time just reading all the research data in parapsychology and and then contacting various researchers in parapsychology to convince myself they weren't all frauds, right? And eventually, it was actually scrutinizing a huge amount of data spreadsheets and writing scripts to crunch them and just finally coming to the conclusion like, these results do not go away, right? I mean, I mean, this this is this is weird, but it's it's one way or the other. Like this 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 is is, is real stuff, and then then you see that this is real stuff, and then you see various phenomena, like people in a meditative trance state 
are better at remote viewing and 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 ESP than than, than people people who are not right. You see, there's various direct connections between spiritualistic modifications of state of consciousness and effectiveness of of parapsychology phenomena. So then then having opened that door, I looked further into data on reincarnation and survival, which again, not everyone who believes in parapsychology believes in those things. And I I totally don't believe in Christian visions of heaven or hell, nor in Hindu mythology of reincarnation. Like none of these things can really be the the full story by any means. There's all sorts of weird holes in all, all these traditional sort of mythological ideas. On the other hand, again, there is data there you cannot wish away, right? I mean, the the, the data of like kids being born knowing details of other people's lives. Yeah. Oh, is I've just had much, uh, Dr. Right? Jim so, Tucker I mean, on this podcast. So then, you know, he's he's the guy at UVA. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that that's that's that's. That's all there, and again, you can dig, you can drill down into the actual first-person reports of, of various yeah. people, and it's not all lies and, and bullshit, right? So, again, what what all this tells you is just there's far more to our life and universe than the conventional rationalist materialist worldview says. It it doesn't tell you that any mythological religion is is correct in in any sense beyond that they make people feel good right it, it, it's but it tells you there's a lot more than what is conventionally conventionally acknowledged and so then when you cross-reference that to the technological singularity and you say well we're gonna we're gonna create minds that are massively more powerful insightful than the human mind right then the odds that these superhuman minds that we create by engineering agis and or via plugging computers into our brains and networking humans together via Wi-Fi telepathy, right? The odds that these transhuman minds are going to be able to understand the aspects of life, the universe, and everything that are still nebulous and confusing to us humans, I mean, it seems very high, right? I mean, just like, you know, apes might look up at the sky and wonder what those lights are, but we, we've just gotten far more understanding of what those shiny lights are in the sky than apes were able to, right? And I mean, in, 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 the, in the same way, you know, superhuman AGIs and mind uploads and enhanced humans are going to be able to get far deeper understanding of survival, re reincarnation, parapsychological phenomena, human consciousness, far deeper understandings of these things than we have. But then then what will they be able to do with it? Like what kind of technologies will be able to will they be able to develop? And once you go in that direction, Terence McKenna's idea that you know post singularity AGIs could use some quantum phenomena that we don't yet understand to reach back in time and in some way influence what humans do to cause their creation. I mean this this starts to seem less insane at, at any rate and you're 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 led to think in, in in fact that's probably not crazy enough i mean as as max born said about some theories of, of quantum mechanics it, it wasn't quite crazy enough to be true right the the reality is probably going to be far crazier than anything we're we're able to able mm. able to to cook up <laughs> now and so this this uh, so yeah how you interleave this line of thinking with what we started off the hour talking about in terms of what's going on in Ukraine and malnutrition and brain stunting among African children. It, it, it's all, it's all quite complex and, and confusing because I mean, there, there are many aspects of the universe. Human beings don't understand at all. There probably are, much more intelligent, much more benevolent minds existing now in the universe than, than, than any of us. On the other hand, in this particular shard of the multiverse that we're living in, there's pretty horrible things happening, right? And the, if the AGI is reaching back in time to cause its creation, why doesn't it reach back in time and give some, give some food to the kids in Ethiopia so they don't grow up brain stunted, right? I mean, so there's... There's, there's clearly a lot we don't understand about the overall order that that we're, that we're act that we're acting within, either from a 
rational or or a sort of spiritual and 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 compassionate point of point of view and i would i i should add this is all my own peculiar self understanding and and uh, my colleagues in singularity net the blockchain project i'm running and opencog hyperon the the agi engineering project i'm running a reasonable percentage are as crazy as i am there's also certainly a good number of highly productive incredibly helpful colleagues who take more of a rationalist materialist view who are contributing in a super ethical and productive way toward building building decentralized blockchain infrastructure and building building agi cognitive algorithms and so forth so i don't, I, I don't think you you need to embrace all this broader perspective to contribute very productively toward bringing about a, a beneficial singularity but it is it is interesting to me that i'm able to mouth off on these crazy ideas on a, on a podcast and i'm not going to be completely shunned from the technology and science community i love that be, yeah. because of it right so i think there is there is a greater acceptance of spiritual perspectives even a slightly greater acceptance of, of parapsychology than, than there was yeah. 10, hundreds years of years ago. ago you wouldn't have AGI been out alive. <laughs> you would have been burned at the stake. Yeah. Depend, well, depend on where you are. I mean, we talked about China in the context of face recognition. I would say right now, tremendous majority of Asian people believe parapsychology is real when they're just like, well, that's, that's old stuff. I'm more interested in my phone, right? But but they're it's not it's not it's not like they dismiss it. So the the whole rationalist materialist worldview is sort of a Western thing. The default in Africa and Asia is to believe that parapsychology exists and that consciousness is is the universal ground, and that's that's taken for granted in India too. I mean, that's the default sort of belief system for the majority of the world's population. It's not what drives those economies, and it's not what the youth there want to think about. But it's it's taken for granted in a very different way than yeah. what you find in, in the U.S. Or, or Western Europe. But even regarding AGI, though, you know, when I got my PhD in math in the mid '80s, and when I when I started working on AGI and published the first book on AGI in 2004, five started the AGI conference series in 2006. The notion of AGI was way out there. And not really subject, not really a subject for polite discussion in a university research seminar or a corporate boardroom, right? Whereas, whereas now, now AGI is, you know, it's part of the marketing slogan for global corporations. Vladimir Putin talked about AGI at the, his talk at the AI Journeys conference a few years ago. So, I mean, we've seen a transition from AGI being on the margins to being well, well, well accepted. Right. And I think the greater acceptance of consciousness as well. Right. I mean, when I, when I was a research fellow in psychology, the university of Western Australia in the mid 1990s, consciousness research was still not fit for polite discussion in the psychology department. And now now consciousness studies is a real part of the psychology field. So I think we're seeing an opening up within the scientific community and the mainstream technology world, even the politics world, we're seeing an opening up to broader understanding of what might be possible and of, of what humanity and the universe might, might be, which is, is interesting. Still, if I look at it empirically, with my hard-nosed scientist self, I'm going to say technology is advancing exponentially in a very clear way. Human consciousness is not opening up exponentially in, in as clear of a way, right? I mean, I mean, there, there's it's there's happening some in of an that. unclear way, <laughs> and there's <laughs> and a lot. Of it is stuff. happening, but it's it's behind the veil. Well, there, there's a, there's an increase in tribalism. There's an increase in narrow-mindedness and yeah, but there's in, also in, in a mass ways. awakening happening I'll, 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 a, also, like right? if you get in right. these conversations with people you think okay this 
this person as a diehard materialist. I that's how I identify this person as or how I characterize them. And then you have a spiritual conversation with them. You take that risk and then you find out the person's seen angels or the person had an out of body experience. Uh, uh, you know, astral projection, right, is what it's called. Uh, like, for example, Vishen Lakhiani, he, probably, uh, he's the founder of Mind Valley. Probably don't think of him as, as a crackpot, I would imagine. I would hope mm-hmm. not. He has a whole online course about astral projection where he brought in one of the leading experts to teach it. And he shares in an interview that uh, he had an out of body experience. Uh, his first one, I think he was still a teenager and changed his life. He was able to uh, travel out of body and uh, go uh, you know, hang out in his, his backyard or something. Uh, it was amazing. So uh, I think even the diehard materialist would agree that somebody like Carl Jung is, was an amazing scientist. And uh, also, uh, fun, fun fact here, that 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 that's that's definitely not true, by the way. So, okay. like, when when I, when I when I, I mean, I spent a number of years in a psych, university yeah. psychology department, and I mean, guys like Jung and Freud are thought of on the par with, say, Plato or Spinoza or something, no. but they're not thought of as scientists. I mean, they were they weren't. He did so they, much amazing they, no, research that, 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 on that, that, uh, he came up with not. the term. Uh, synchronicity, and he did all this research on synchronicities and wrote the the book on it. Well, right, but right, but science, science I, I, again, if you put the hard nosed empiricist hat on, I mean, science is about creating precise hypotheses and validating or, or refuting them. And anecdotal evidence isn't science. Jung's book Synchronicity okay. was all anecdotal yeah, I, evidence. I, I, your, I, I see your point. I mean, if you look at Freud. I mean, Freud came up with the notion mm-hmm. of repression, which is real. He also had the ele- Electra complex, and all women are plagued in their childhood by the desire to be, by by the desire to be boys, so that they can have the desire to have sex with their mom and and kill their dad. Right? I mean, there there's a lot of weird right. stuff in there, along with stuff that we now consider valid, and they didn't have a method for winnowing through which of their ideas h- held up or not, which is what the the scientific mm, method yeah. g- gives, right? So, I mean, I, I I find Jung and his whole notion of archetypes and the collective unconscious incredibly inspirational. And I think there's a deep validity there mm. to the notion of synchronicity also, but definitely those guys were not scientists in the, okay. in, in the modern sense. And the, the interplay between spiritual intuitive insight and science and engineering is going to be one of the more interesting things during the next couple decades as we advance towards singularity i think because something like agi robotics brain computer interfacing i mean to make these work this takes a very rigorous hard-nosed scientific approach and i mean you would probably agree if you're going to get your head cut open and get some wires stuck in to connect your brain to a peripheral, you probably want a very rigorous and careful yeah. testing methodology oh, to be to be carried out uh, on the on that machinery, right? On, on the other hand, there's very big decisions to be made about you know what direction to take technology and what what when when to roll things out, who controls mm-hmm. what what technology, and we don't have science to make those strategic decisions, right? So those strategic decisions are either being made on a sort of spiritual inspired basis, or they're being made on an ego greed and selfishness and and tribalism driven basis. Right. And so we need, we need to reconcile the scientific engineering empiricist point of view that will throw out the brain computer interface if it didn't hold up to testing, right? We need to get that view working very closely together with an inspired and uh, spiritual mindset and and perspective for guiding the, the strategic decisions. Right. And we, I would say that that's not how things are mostly working now, how things are mostly working now is decisions on science and technology 
are they're being made for a position of ego and a position of of of, yeah, of tribalism, agreed. right? And this is this is a significant significant issue. So my my friend Gabriel Axel is working on an app and a whole program called Pathform. The one of the motives of which is to sort of enlighten the AGI developers and the technologists of the world. So to try try to combine various consciousness practices together, consciousness expansion practices into a, a program that will be appealing to technical people and, and AI developers and nanotech developers and brain computer interface developers with, with, with a view toward increasing the percentage of people that work on the nitty gritty technology who are are coming at it from from really a, a perspective of, of broader blissful consciousness and, and states of extraordinary well-being because the more the more the developers are coming coming up what they're doing from that perspective the more likely the strategic decisions are, are, are going to be in, informed in a sort of in, in enlightened way and that's a I mean, if you look at the rollout of face recognition, it was mostly developed from a standpoint of just neutral academic curiosity. It's being mostly rolled out now for espionage and for, you know, tribalistic purposes and secondarily for commercial purposes and figuring out what 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 to sell you, right? So what what started out sort of ethically neutral is mostly being deployed in in an ethically bad way, right? And Brain, brain computer interfacing is an example where we would yeah. really rather not have For it sure. come out that way, right? <laughs> I, I, I mean, and I mean, a, 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 AGI, of course, is, is a different example. So look at the, the assistants in our smartphones, uh, Siri and Google Assistant. These things are pretty dumb right now. One thing I want to do with OpenCog Hyper, I'm running on SingularityNet, is make smartphone assistants that actually are smart and understand what's going on. But again, this can be done from a standpoint of brainwashing you to buy a bunch of garbage you don't need and believe a bunch of bullshit. Or it could be done from a standpoint of having these smartphone assistants, you know, help you through your day and remind you when you're not being your 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 best self and help you keep on track with, with spiritual practices and help connect you with the experiences you need to take the next step in your own growth, right? So these these sort of smartphone assistant apps could go either way and it, it depends on who owns them and it depends on who's developing them and what is their state of consciousness as, as they're doing the, the development. Right. And that, that's, a, that's, that's sort of the bifurcation or, or choice point we're at now, which is a quite, quite interesting position to be in. And the, I think I'm, 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 <laughs> <laughs> out of out of time here, I think. But this uh, is I'm, fabulous. I'm, I'm glad, what a I'm glad. great conversation we had, and uh, just a fun fact to share with you to, to round off this interview. Uh, Terrence McKenna became interested in psychology because at age fourteen he read Carl Jung's book Psychology and Alchemy. At age fourteen, he read Carl Jung's book Psychology and Alchemy. Yeah. Oh wow. Oh, this is yeah, fun. Yeah. All right. So interesting. <laughs> yeah, I. I no, we can we can talk about young and archetypes for for a long time, but we yeah, we can yeah. save that for a follow up next stuff. year. All right. So, yeah. how does our listener or viewer uh, learn more from you, uh, follow you uh, on on social, and read your stuff, all that sort of stuff? Where where should they go? Yeah. So my my personal website gertzel dot org has links to my. Twitter and, and LinkedIn and a bunch of my books and podcasts and so forth on there. For my professional work, you can look at singularitynet.io, which is the AI meets blockchain project I lead, which has links to a bunch of other stuff on it too. So that, that should keep you busy, keep you busy for a while. I did a four hour oh, podcast with Lex awesome. Friedman we'll on AI a, a couple the, years the, ago. Show notes, we didn't, we didn't, yeah, and I would say on on Psy and reincarnation, I did a couple of podcasts on uh, 
New Thinking Aloud podcast, going specifically into the, oh, into those awesome. areas. Yeah, we'll also. include all that in the show notes for this episode. Fabulous, Ben. Thank you so much, and thank you, listener, and and uh, you know, just keep an open mind and and stay curious. We'll catch you on the next episode. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off. Sure.